For the American Negro, the 1960s have been years of protest, with marches and demonstrations all across the land. Where there was public evidence of inequality, there was protest. The tactic was nonviolence. Early on in North Carolina, a handful of students sitting in at Greensboro and Durham lunch counters bore witness for the complaints of Negroes. North Carolina's governor has acknowledged that the voice of this minority, one-fourth of the people of the state, should be clearly heard. But, he added, if the street is a noisy stage for airing grievances, final persuasion must come in the human heart and mind. The governor challenged Negro students to turn physical action into a genuine dialogue with the whole community. One result, a four-part minority report on film and television, sets forth the aspirations of young Negroes today. On this program, Students and faculty from North Carolina College in Durham tell how they divided four historic years between their studies and demonstrations. The reason that I have, that I have participated in the demonstration stems somewhat from my home training. For ever since I've been a sm small child, my parents have taught me to stand up for what I believed in and for the principles in which I believed. Uh, demonstrations to me are a last resort. Uh, I have demonstrated in other ways before, even through the courts. And uh, I feel that um, by moving to the streets, we as Negroes are trying to awaken the consciences of white Americans to the injustices uh, to which we have been subjected for so many years. I felt that my taking part in the demonstration would bring about in reality all of those things that we feel every American is entitled to. I felt that Negroes as Americans, Negroes as people whose ancestors, particularly in the South, have made cotton king with unpaid for labor, I felt that only by demonstrating could I see these things realized. Growing up in a ghetto in a mid-Atlantic uh, city, being born in a segregated hospital, going to segregated public schools, then running into uh, segregation, discrimination of the worst sort in uh, World War II as a teenage soldier. Uh, my whole past uh, more or less set me up in tune uh, for this uh, uh, what we might call young people's uh, revolution or revolt in America. I like to feel, though, that uh, I'm young enough to be identified <laughs> with the young people's uh, movement. As a matter of fact, after we began to sit in at a particular place, several people uh, started to really brutally beat a young lady who was a member of the, uh, the demonstrators. Now, prior to going down, I had taken the nonviolent oath and realizing the expediency of nonviolence. I was firmly committed to it. But I hope to God that no son of mine ever has to get out in the streets to watch his sweetheart or his sister or other young ladies be beaten in the process of trying to make a realization the rights that are guaranteed to all Americans under the Constitution. There have been a great number of indignities that I have suffered, and um, now I speak of physical harm. I've been spat upon and kicked and stomped in the stomach. Um, two guards in an Atlanta uh, prison tried to rape me. Um, this sort of thing has happened to me. But I think that even the physical violence does not hurt me as much as to see my brother um, suffer the subtle uh, indignities that you really can't put your finger on. And as we walked up to the threshold of the door of this restaurant, the manager was standing there to greet us. And he 
intensified his greetings with a double barrel shotgun in his hand. And uh, he stood there and he said, if either one of you damn niggas crosses that threshold, I'll blow your damn brains out. Uh, this was very devastating, uh, psychologically and emotionally. And he was standing there in such a frenzy that I thought maybe he would b blow our brains out whether we crossed the threshold or not. Unfortunately, he didn't. Well, there are many forces which uh, act to trick of violence, but one of the main ones I find is the gathering of, of whites cross from demonstrations, especially where there are massive demonstrations and, and occasionally there are just as great a number of whites across the street. And the police are in the middle usually with their back to the whites instead of paying attention to what the whites are doing. And the whites are, in many instances, acting to provoke the Negro demonstrators into active violence. Uh, white policemen are trained to counteract violence. Uh, they do not know how to counteract this nonviolent technique. Uh, in demonstrations I have been involved in, they have been completely baffled as to what to do. And incidents that are extremely uh, provoking, uh, that would provoke violence on my part, I think stand out in my mind most of all, because I know that by becoming violent, I would certainly destroy the principle for which I am demonstrating. We were picketing, and uh, this girlfriend of mine was walking behind me, and about eight hoodlums came up and harassed us and insulted us, as they usually do. But uh, three of the fellows decided that they were going to uh, disrobe this young lady, and they proceeded to do so right there on the streets. This was one time when I questioned the value of nonviolence. This was one time when I almost became nonviolent. And uh, I think this is the kind of thing that uh, really tests an individual's commitment to the nonviolent philosophy. Well, when the um, demonstrations first began, I called home to notify my parents that I was going to participate. I am from the North, and they were rather against me participating. At, well, rather, in New York, you look at television, and this is what you see as far as demonstrations are concerned. You see um, people being kicked or stomped by the police or you see a fellow brethren being drugged down the street or a dog chasing him or something of this sort. And they felt that this physical harm could come to me. My father felt that if he was here with me, that he could in some way protect me against this physical harm. And because I have grown up with whites and gone to integrated schools, my mother felt that my outlook towards life or rather towards whites, would change because of these demonstrations. My parents are very interested in mine participate, participating in demonstrations. They have always taught us to stand up for what we believe and our convictions. And when I first started demonstrating, well, they had a positive attitude about this because they knew this was what I wanted to do and I had to do. Um, they are behind me 100%. And uh, they feel that it is necessary for me uh, to go to jail and to sacrifice in any way possible because I've explained to them that each time I undergo some type of indignity or sacrifice more, I become more committed and uh, rededicated to the principles upon which I stand. As an American citizen, as one who put on a uniform quite some time ago to defend the American way of life, as one who uh, would have readily given his life to have kept the American system going, I, I think it's very despairing to have to participate in demonstrations to get that which is really a actually and rightfully ours. 
I don't think the student should lose class time. There are some who would object to this. I think that my first responsibility is to prepare myself to step into these new opportunities that inevitably will come as segregation is completely broken down. And I think it, my, my basic responsibility is to become totally prepared to compete with any American for the type of position that I want, the type of job that I like to hold, the part that I'm to play in society. And I think that the only way I can do this is to study hard, to be diligent in my study, and to prepare myself to take advantage of the, the benefits of democracy. I believe that each person plays a part in some way. Some people do not choose to um, overtly demonstrate by going out in the streets, where at the same time they could uh, possibly do typing or answering the phone. Some people um, who are in college now, as I am, uh, and who do not demonstrate, or perhaps uh, have a reason, uh, for instance, uh, they are studying uh, to go into law or to gain an education so that they can fill the jobs that the other Negroes are in the streets demonstrating for. Freedom and equality in every aspect of American life is something I want now. And I felt that after the trials and tribulations were over, and after I had given my time in the demonstrations, which were foremost, I used all of my, what you call, leisure time for studies. The, the uh, faculty member um, in a Negro college, in the Southern Negro college, where they are, these <laughs> Negro colleges exist, are, for the most part, uh, much older than the uh, generation that uh, I belong to and they may have deceived themselves into believing that uh, they had found a niche that was safe in the uh, deep in the bosom of this country but uh, I think now the demonstrations have proven to be perhaps the most effective means by which the Negro can express the pain, the anguish, the humility, the ravished character that has uh, sort of hovered over the mass of Negroes in this country. And he may become more sympathetic in the future. I, I would have to say that after the demonstrations really got started, and after it was dramatized, that the Negro could make gains only when he went to the streets after all other efforts had failed. I think this brought to them the moment of truth they realize that the philosophy of wait until there is a change in the hearts and minds of men was not really as effective at, as many people said it was. I think we drove home to them the point that demonstrations do produce tangible results that negotiations don't necessarily produce. And I think that many of those who do not actively demonstrate with us or who express openly a sympathy with us, I think they do sympathize with us. Uh, demonstrations, uh, as we think of them, are not the only way in which we can achieve, achieve equal rights, but along with demonstrations and working through the courts, negotiations, and other forms of protest, the Negro will gain equal rights. We know for a fact that when the Founding Fathers found this country, they held certain truth to be self-evident that all men were created equal. However, we find that, this was, that the Negro apparently was not included. We are aware of the fact that the Civil War was fought more than a hundred years ago. We are aware of the fact that citizenship and all of the things that are supposed to accompany citizenship were granted to the Negro, uh, theoretically that is, at that particular time. But yet, we are aware of the fact that a hundred years have elapsed. And there is still a great difference in what the American people say to the developing nations all over the world, what the American Constitution says, and what the American Negro is actually able to realize. Uh, even the Negro who is considered the black bourgeoisie um, wants more than just to be able to own a home but to be able to own a home in any section and uh, to own property that he wants in any section of the town, to be able to um, 
have the right to the buck and to spend that money where he wants to and to uh, pursue happiness in any way that he chooses. Of course, there are specific freedoms, I think. Um, namely, the right to the ballot, which is fundamental to our way of life. And also the right to become a part of the economic mainstream of America. You see, where you deny to a major segment of your population, uh, even though that segment is a minority, you are really defeating one of the basic purposes of the American way of life. Um, our job was to help organize the community and prepare the students or whoever was to demonstrate uh, by having nonviolent workshops, by uh, teaching them and exposing them to the doctrine of nonviolence, to uh, giving them um, a sense of racial pride by telling them of our great history from St. Augustine and the four black Latin fathers on down. And, um, to really plan strategy and techniques and demonstrations to negotiate, first of all, um, uh, in, a, in an attempt to um, prevent demonstrations if possible. A white man recognizes the Negro is human, but is compelled by ulterior motives to lie to himself and to others and to say that uh, the Negro is basically not human. Now, he may not say this in these words exactly, but his actions will say this for him. You cannot in one phrase say that the American way of life is equality for all people and then say the Negro must stay back. This is a basic inconsistency. I feel that uh, the white liberal has helped when he has made a stand and stuck to his conviction, whether it be um, writing newspaper articles or letters to the editors or getting out on the streets and really demonstrating, but um, white or Negro, who is uh, for the movement and only pays lip service, uh, in my estimation, uh, well, I think that the whites who participate in demonstrations have really analyzed the situation and have uh, come to a conclusion that what segregation stands for is wrong and that they must take the stand. And I, am, I feel very proud of these people because they suffer more indignities on picket lines and in demonstrations than Negroes because uh, their fellow the fellow whites, uh, those segregationists, are against them more than they are us, and that they really have uh, more name callings and things than we have. A lot of white people don't realize that the Negro is human. And I have found it difficult to understand them, but the more I get into it, I realize that some uh, segregationists believe as strongly as I do that they are right. And this is the only way, separation of the races. I think he wants an equal right himself. I think he does, he does not want any special privileges, as some would suggest. I think he merely wants the right to decide for himself, the right to determine for himself, rather than have someone impose on him the position that he is to play in American society. It is impossible for any Negro to feel that uh, segregation will only be in the South as long as his skin remains black. However, uh, in the North, it's more or less um, subtle, you know, quiet in oh, oh, so 500. You don't... Um, oh, oh, so 500? Well, high class. Mm -hmm. You, uh, they just won't out and out say you're not wanted here. Uh, you can come into these places. Uh, they will take their time about serving you in some places, however. I think legislation is a part of what can be done. I have no doubt that legislation cannot solve the inequality. It cannot uh, 
carry to America the idea that the Negro wants freedom, but I think it's a significant step in that direction. The old Negro had a tremendous economical problem. Uh, the young Negro had to work, whereas today many young Negroes are in school. They have much more time. They've been educated much more as to what the evils are that exist in American society today. And they have many channels which are open to them that were not open to the former Negro. Of course, as we know uh, from the history of the Negro, when he first came to America uh, as a slave, he protested. Uh, there were several outstanding leaders like Harriet Tubman, Sir Bernard Truth, uh, a whole list of them. Uh, but I think that the Negro today has assumed a uh, new militancy and uh, he's daring because he has an opportunity to dare, uh, much of which, which his uh, predecessor did not have. America and the democratic ideal are saying that uh, all men are free, they all are entitled to the rights of democracy, that a man is born with certain inherent rights. However, no, no one can deny that Negroes have been denied these inherent rights. And I think this is the part of democracy that is hypocritical. And I think what the white man is going to have to do is stop being so arrogant, stop being so proud, and recognize the fact that we are all human beings. We're going to have to get this universal humanity concept. I think it affects the psychology of a Negro. It, it invariably breeds in him an inferiority, a feeling of inferiority. And I think it's harmful not only to the Negro, but it's harmful to America as a whole. And I think this is a major fault of uh, discrimination. The Negro now, I feel, basically believes that the principles of the American Constitution can be achieved and that America can do it. But if America should fail to do this, then I think that many Negroes will resort to violent means. I think basically the demonstrations have been led by Americans who feel that it's time for America to wake up and begin to live its ideal, the ideal of democracy, the ideal of equality, the ideal of the inherent goodness of human beings. I think demonstrators realize that, first of all, America must live up to its ideal in facing other nations. Uh, this, has, this Negro movement has been called a revolution. Usually in revolutions there is a move to overthrow that which actually exists. Well, this movement is to overthrow something, but it is not the political structure of America. I think that Negroes are demonstrating for America rather than demonstrating against America. And I think that uh, in many instances, those who do demonstrate are seeking to take over the reins of leadership. While this is not the case with the Negro Revolution in America, they are only seeking to gain their rightful part in the leadership rather than to take it over all for themselves. Is it really a man's due that he be denied uh, the rights that are his inherently? from the very time that he is born until the time that he dies, from the time that he is born in a segregated hospital until he is buried in a segregated cemetery, and all in between is nothing but a pattern of segregation. I think the Negro really wants the right not to be the invisible man. Much of the leadership has been provided by students. Uh, there is a tendency on the part of many of the older generation to advocate a rather go slow policy. Uh, but I think that now, after demonstrations have been going on for quite some time, that many of those who have originally advocated this go slow policy are being won over to the new mil militancy on the part of the Negro student movement. And I think that more and more this will be the case until eventually 
uh, most, if not all, will realize that this freedom must come, it must come now, and that you can't give a man his freedom too soon. Well, here in North Carolina, the North Carolina Fund uh, has said on numerous occasions that it would welcome suggestions as to means that could be employed to alleviate poverty in the state. I think uh, that the main thing that should be done is to enfranchise across the board the Negro, to make him a part of the state in the truest sense of the word. You cannot say, in other words, you want to alleviate poverty and deny to a large segment of the public the right to help itself. Um, each arrest and each conviction gives me a sort of different feeling. I remember uh, when only two of us were jailed in Durham, North Carolina. Only two. Only two. And um, that night, um, we were in a cell with a bunch of drunks and loud people, and it was filthy. And yet, somehow, with all that noise and all the filth, um, I think I, it was sort of a sanctuary, you know, a, a place where I felt that I had almost achieved uh, freedom, a sort of peace of mind. And I think that for the first time, I believed in God. <laughs>